One day there was a fire in a wastebasket in the office of the Dean of Sciences. In rushed a physicist, a chemist, and a statistician. The physicist immediately starts to work on how much energy would have to be removed from the fire to stop the combustion. The chemist works on which reagent would have to be added to the fire to prevent oxidation. While they are doing this, the statistician is setting fires to all the other waste baskets in the office. What are you doing? The others demand. The statistician replies, well, to solve the problem, you obviously need a larger sample size. And here we are on talking about getting random samples. So we had some experience in the previous lesson dealing with getting random rectangles that we were working with. And we used a random number table to do that. How do we draw random samples in general? Well, let's say I was, let's look at a prize drawing. So in a prize drawing, let's say I'm giving out uh, sodas to half the students in my class. And I start alphabetically with the roster and I say, okay, I'm gonna flip a coin. If you get heads, you get the soda. If you get tails, you don't get to the soda. And I go until I run out of sodas. Who is most likely to object to this plan? The kids with the last names near Z because they're at the bottom of the roster. The probability that I'm going to make it all the way down and still have some soda left is not so good. The probability of the first person, first couple of people are going to get a soda is like 50-50 compared to the people in the bottom. So what's the way we normally draw for prizes in the class? Well, we tend to use like a box or a hat and we put the names in. So this is the gold standard for drawing a simple random sample. You put all the individuals. So I would take each student, put their name in the hat. Now, if I had said, um, written their names down, put them in the hat alphabetically and just started to draw, someone might object. Usually you want me to mix them well. So that's a very important part so we can introduce this randomization. Then I would draw until I got all of my sample or winners if it's a prize drawing. Now one thing, if I'm drawing, let's say I draw Abe's name first, then I put his name back in the hat. What would people say? They go, wait a second, you're only supposed to draw them once. And for samples, we're only supposed to draw them once. So if you put the name back in the hat, you need to ignore repeats, all right? One way you can avoid that is just leave the name out of the hat. But if you're using something like computers or calculators, they will automatically, they will have some repeats in there. So it's always good to say, ignore the repeats. After that, you would survey every individual that you drew, and that would be your sample. This is often called the hat method. And why is it preferred for random drawings? because all outcomes are equally likely. No one is more likely to get selected than someone else in the hat. Now, we don't always use simple random samples, and why would that be? Well, there can be some challenges in getting simple random samples. If I wanted to survey a sample all the students at the high school, even though I'm a teacher, it's difficult for me to get a listing of everybody due to privacy issues. So maybe I wouldn't do a simple random sample of all the students in the high school. If I was trying to do all the students going to prom, the problem is I don't have a list of students going to prom. I could actually take a list of people who had bought tickets and sample them, but that wouldn't give me everybody going to prom because you know some people wait till the last minute. Customers at a grocery store, that's even worse. They're moving around and I definitely don't have a list. That would be a difficult one to sample randomly using an SRS method. Trees in a forest, we could do it. I could map every tree and number every tree or name it some unique identifier. And then I could put them all in a hat and draw them. But that would be a real pain. So again, the simple random sample is the gold standard but next I'm going to go over some of the different random sampling techniques because of these challenges. One favorite way to survey is with clusters. So we're going to use the image at the right here to come up with a definition for a cluster. Um, if you look at the groups, there are groups of people here, another group, a group, a group. What would a cluster be? Well, a cluster is a, a group, really. 
And it doesn't mean that the group has to have everything in common. Now, this one looks like everybody has something in common. You could almost say these people have something in common. But there's a mix, really. So clusters are really just groups of individuals that are located near each other geographically or in some other way. Maybe it's a texting group or some other type of cluster where they're all together in some spot. So what's an example of a cluster in a high school? It would be a classroom, a bus route, everybody together on the bus, neighborhoods, anytime you have groups put together. Now, um, the way you would draw a cluster sample is what you do is instead of putting the individuals in a hat, you put the cluster names in the hat. And then don't forget to mix well. So we mix the cluster names in. And the clusters could be like classrooms. So my classroom uh, right now is D231. And you can have D232, 233, 234, 235. Throw them all in a hat and figure out which classrooms we're going to sample. So we put all those rooms in the hat, mix well, and draw until we get our sample. Now, as always, ignore repeats for samples. And then here's the difference with the cluster sample. With a cluster, what you're going to do is you're going to serve, survey everyone in the drawn group. So if I pull room D231, I'm going to go ahead and actually survey everyone in D231. All right. Now, why would we prefer this to a simple random sample method? Well, it may be e much easier to identify and sample clusters. If I were to have you go into school and say, oh, get me a simple random sample of all the high school students, that means you have to get all the names, throw them in a hat, draw, and then go find those people to survey them. It's way easier to find a classroom. It's like right there. It doesn't move. So cluster samples are one of the most popular ways to do sampling. Now, I'll do a quick example with the two methods. You're going to survey students seated in the cafeteria. How would you do a simple random sample? Now, I actually did do a survey of the cafeteria uh, in the spring. And what I did, I could have done a simple random sample. And if I'd done that, I would basically number every seat in the cafeteria, have some sort of unique identifier. Then I would put all those seat numbers in a hat, mix it well, and draw seat numbers without replacing to, to avoid repeats until I get however many people I want to survey. Then I would survey the people in the selected seats. Now I didn't do it that way. Why? Because the seats kind of move around and it's very hard to get a listing. And not only that, I was the population here would have just been seated students and I'm okay with that. Um, but that's, see, it, it's very difficult because the seats can move around. So how would you draw a cluster sample in the cafeteria? That's actually what I did. So instead of numbering the seats, the one thing that doesn't move around very well are the tables. So I numbered the tables, threw them in a hat, mixed it well, and then drew my sample. So I basically went to each table then, and I surveyed every student at the table. That way I went up to him, I said, your table has been randomly selected for our survey. And everyone is invited to do the survey. And so those are cluster samples. My clusters were the tables in the cafeteria. Again, a very good and convenient way to sample if there's no reason to think that there are differences between one table and another. Now, another way we can sample is something called stratified sampling. If you look at the image at right, what would you say a strata is? Well, here's one strata another, 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 and another. You can see that each of my groupings are alike. They share something in common. So strata are groups or classes in a population that share a common characteristic. Uh, in high school, that would frequently be by grade level because freshmen and seniors tend to be slightly different creatures. Trust me, seniors do not want to be confused with freshmen or sophomores with freshmen or juniors with sophomores for that matter. Another way you can do strata is ethnicity. So if you're concerned about, you know, minorities, uh, you can also do it by socioeconomic if you're worried about income level. So there are different things that you can look at and group people based on strata. Uh, sometimes certain strata don't make sense. For example, in the summer program that I'm teaching, I have kids from Austin AISD, Round Rock AISD, Leander, etc. I could separate them by school district, but that wouldn't really be as meaningful because there's no reason to think that an Austin kid is that different from a Round Rock kid or a Leander kid. So um, 
that sometimes strata makes sense, especially for grade levels, things that would create common characteristics in the group. So how do we set up a stratified sample? Well, if you look at the picture at right, these are the steps for doing a stratified sample. How does this picture look different from my other pictures with the hats in them? Hopefully you notice there's more than one hat here. It's like I'm doing a simple random sample in each strata. Each strata gets its own hat. All right, each stra strata gets its own simple random sample. So we set up a hat for each strata. In each hat, we're going to put not the strata, but the individuals. So we have, um, we could do the freshman hat and the sophomore hat. So the freshmen go in the freshman hat, sophomores go in the sophomore hat. And after we do that, mix it well. Draw until you get the sample you want for that strata. Ignore repeats as always. And after you get the individuals from each strata, go ahead and survey everyone that you pulled from the different hats. In this example, we have a hotel with eight floors and 30 rooms on each floor. It has 96 rooms facing the ocean and another 48 with a partial ocean view and 36 facing inland. Room numbers have the first digit from the floor number and the next two digits range from 1 to 30 for each floor. Rooms facing, facing the ocean cost the most, partial ocean views the next, and inland rooms the least. What strata could you use? Well, I could go by floor number, right? But is there really a difference between a person who gets a hotel room on a second floor and a third floor? Not really, all right? Probably if I wanted to group like-minded hotel stayers, I would put the people who are willing to pay a little extra for an ocean view in one group and the people who want to save their money and have the inland view in another group. And of course, the partial view would be the compromisers. They'd be in the middle group. So don't use the floors because there's no difference there. Use the room view type. All right. How could you draw a stratified sample? Well, I would have set up a hat for each view type ocean hat, a partial hat, and an inland hat. Then I would put all the, I wouldn't worry too much about this first digit from the floor. I would just basically take all the floor numbers, all the hotel room numbers, and put them in the appropriate hat if they have an ocean view, inland, uh, partial view, or inland view. Mix uh, for each strata for the ocean hat, mix it well. And then I would draw room numbers without replacement till I got the desired sample size because I want to ignore repeats. Then I would also draw samples from the partial hat and the inland hat. Now, if I was drawing samples from these, one thing to keep in mind would, let's say I wanted 20, all right? If I wanted 20 rooms uh, for, for my sample, how would I draw it from the different strata? Well, you could say, well, let me roughly divide by a third. I would get, say, seven with the ocean view, seven with the inland view, and six with the partial view. Well, that might be okay, but I don't have an equal number of rooms of each type. There are actually different proportions. So one thing I could do is look at the percentage of the population that I want to sample. All right. So 240 total rooms. I want 20. So I roughly need one, uh, one twelfth of the total sample size. All right. Um, a little over 8% in case you're interested. So I would take one twelfth of the ocean views and I'd sample eight rooms. One twelfth of the partial, which is four, and then one twelfth of the inland and sample eight rooms there. This strategy is called proportional allocation. Sometimes people are moving around or your individuals are moving around so much that you really can't pin things down and do clusters or stratified sampling. There's still another technique we can use that includes a little bit of randomization to give us uh, to avoid bias. And this a technique is called systematic sampling. Now, if you look at my graphic here, what do you notice? I have what looks like a line of individuals. And if you count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What am I doing? I'm sampling every tenth person. So a systematic sample is a sample created by selecting every nth individual. So you go skip every so many. 
When we might we want to do a systematic sampling in a high school? Well, lunch lines is a perfect example. You can also get students coming in and out of a certain area. So like the library would be a great place to do a systematic sample. Now, how do we do it? Where's the randomization involved? Because if I say every 10th, doesn't that automatically tell me who I'm sampling? Well, there's still something we can randomize. So first of all, you do get to pick the frequency or how many different, you know, how many you go till you skip or how many you skip, I should say, uh, the frequency that you want to use to sample. Ideally greater than 10, and I'll tell you why in a future lesson. Um, here I use 10 and that's okay. Now you're going to put the numbers 1 through n. So if you decide to sample every 10 people, you're going to go 1 through 10. If you do every 15, 1 through 15. You put them in the hat and of course you mix it well. Then you draw the starting point. That is what is randomized. You do not automatically start with the first person you see. Then you would sample every ninth individual from that starting point. So if you wanted to survey every 20th person in the lunch line, how would you select your sample? Well, you put the numbers 1 through 20 and a half and mix well. Draw one number to select the starting point and then select every 20th person. And that is a systematic sample. It has a little bit of randomization. Now, there is a sampling method that is used the most, which shouldn't be used the most. In fact, this is the one type of sample you should avoid because there is no randomization. Now, if you recall from our previous lesson, when we used convenience or judgment, our estimates of our parameters were actually more biased than we use randomization. So what does it mean when you do a convenience sample? It's like, oh, let me just go ask these people. Or let's say I give you an assignment to do a survey and say, well, I'll just ask the people in my statistics class. Convenient samples are convenient. And if you don't feel like working hard, you tend to do them. Unfortunately, you're usually wasting your time. Uh, if you leave customer satisfaction surveys in the lobby of a hotel, you're asking for bias. All right. I promise you. The people who are eh, on the hotel aren't going to bother to spend their time to fill out a survey. People who are really happy might, and people who are really upset might. So again, avoid convenient samples at all costs. So what were the big ideas from today's lesson? Well, we talked about simple random sampling, cluster sampling, stratified sampling, systematic sampling, and the horrors of convenient sampling.